Welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. I'm Mike Pullen, I do most of the editing on the show, and you're probably wondering what this is on the top of my lip. It's November this month, which is uh, a bit of a charity thing where you grow a moustache for, for November to raise some money to, for charity. I actually have a day job and I, one of the kids I taught at school said, uh, so it looks like a slug has crawled on the top of your lip and died. So yeah, that was a nice thing. So we've done this Q&A video for you guys because we've had so many comments come through uh, it's just clogging up my emails at the moment. There's actually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails we get coming through. So I said to Graham, let's do a Q&A video. That way we might be able to answer some of your questions uh, and, and cover quite a few questions that are repeated. So let's crack on with the questions. Right, so it looks like the first question here we've got is, uh, is from Sam Gill on Facebook. And he says, why does my dad <laughs> never catch fish when we go fishing? Go fishing. Never catch fish when you go fishing. Look, it's totally awesome. We always catch fish when we go fishing. Well, no, we have actually thrown the old blank in there. It's difficult to say. Is your dad using a fishing rod, a fishing reel, a hook, and... Sounds like he needs dynamite. I've no idea. I mean, that's a pretty open question why he's not fishing. He honestly needs to watch some more of the Totally Awesome Fishing shows, guys. You need to, you know, you need to think a bit like the fish, you know, when are you going to feed? How many times are you going to feed during the day? Let's take, just as a for instance, let's just say you're a carp. Any members of the carp family, you know, roach, tench, chub, barbel, they're going to feed on the little and often basis. So you're going to have to be there all the way really through a day, maybe half a day. And within that period, they're not going to feed madly all that time. They're going to feed for a little while. So after you've had one or two sessions, assuming you get some bites, put another session in there in the same period. So it might be in the winter, it might be two or three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon, more likely when it's getting dusk. And also, I hate it myself getting up at dawn, I hate it. But honestly, guys, dawn is a good time to go fishing. Dusk, especially in the winter, is a very good time, the late afternoon and dusk, good time to go fishing. So think times. You don't, you know, there's it's no magic in it, really. It's all down to knowledge at the end of the day. And I can't sort of, I can't really give you the gut feeling that fishermen have been doing it a long time. Why, why should I cast over there? or I'm not going to go pipe fishing, I'm going to go bream fishing. It's something you sort of learn over the years. So, you know, a good question, but all I can say is try and think dawn and dusk. Guys, it's horrible getting up early in the morning. Perhaps it's not nice, nice staying out later in the evening towards dark. That's when the fish bite. That's when you've got to be there. The, uh, the second question, uh, and this is honestly a genuine question you can go on our Facebook from Dave Gibson. Can he have some some moustache growing tips, please, Graham? <laughs> oh, that's rich. That's really rich. How to grow a moustache? That's that's weird. I've got to tell you the truth here, guys. Like a lot of young men, when you get to about sixteen, leave school. You want long hair. Man, I had long hair down to my shoulders. What was called a greaser years ago. It's a greaser, which was a sort of motorbike enthusiast. Except I couldn't afford a motorbike. My mum and dad wouldn't let me have one. So I had a push bike. So all my pals when they were seventeen had nice motorbikes, I had, I think it was Honda 125s at the time, and they used to get the exhaust pipes and, and mess about with them like all young men do it, and take what's called the baffles out of them, so they make really, really loud. They sound like, well, they sound like a Harley Davidson on crack cocaine. They were really loud, they'd be banned now. That's what it was. And of course, we all tried to grow a little bit of stubble, a little bit of moustache. I, I was, when I was about 17, I thought, yeah, I'm gonna grow one. It took like forever. I just sat there trying to force, force the hairs out. And the few hairs I got out, they just looked like the fluff of a cat's backside. So, and this is the truth. Would I tell you any lies here at Totally Awesome? To make it look cool when we used to go out looking for girls, we used to use, yes, a little bit of boot polish, right, and a toothbrush. And dip that in and just brush away there, trying to get every tiny piece of fluff as black as possible so that you could look macho and tough for the girls at the disco. And then of course, you know what it's like, you go out to the disco, that's right, all the girls are over that side, all the boys are over this side. Try, boys are trying to look cool and tough. They're desperate to go over there with the girls and the girls are like, oh, look at those boys over there. Nobody ever did anything, we never danced. I think we would have got drunk. So, you can use boot polish, don't blame me. And if you're really young, don't start pencil it in. It's tough to get off, which I found. But if you do do that, guys, or you use some of those staining compounds you can get now, but I better not mention the name, 
make sure you do get it accurate. Well, you make sure you get it accurate. Don't sort of answer the phone and get a skid along there because it will stay there. But yes, we've all grabbed moustaches. I've shaved mine off a couple of times. It's horrible. It looks like, who's the man with no lip? It's weird. But yeah, good question. Good question. For a non-fishing question, that's a good one. Okay, question number three is from Richard Blanco. And he says, braid versus mono, or heavy mono versus fluorocarbon leaders. What are your thoughts on that? Well, braid versus mono, but he's also thrown a, a curveball in there as well, because he's mentioned fluorocarbon. Okay, I can only give you my views. I'm not really a great lover of either fluorocarbon or really braid. Now braid, it has those non-stretch qualities. So if you're say sea fishing and you're fishing in deep water, small fish, absolutely no problem at all really good for bite detection if you let it go slack in the wind it is a living nightmare as a lot of anglers will tell you if you use it on a multiplier from the beach and try to cast out it can be a living nightmare and possibly remove the top of your thumb i don't really really like it it's okay with a fixed ball you can cast it out it goes miles because it has a thin diameter i personally am quite happy just using monofilament i don't really mind about if it's too thick you know I want, what I want is abrasion resistance I do like abrasion resistant mono fresh water we don't sell it we don't sell the tackle I used to use for years maxima chameleon that's all I used to use in five pound for fresh water it wasn't the world's greatest abrasion resistant line okay but I did used to like it I have now changed to some stuff that a guy called Nigel Newport actually put me on and he's a matchman um it's pro gold and that was, I think it's in six pound, probably a finer diameter, but really impressive, good abrasion resistance. It does actually, you know, do the job for me. Will I change? I'm not one to keep changing all the time. I, you know, I'm happy with, if I'm catching fish and it don't bust, I'm gonna stick with it. As for fluorocarbon, I've used it in the sea. I've used it freshwater fishing as well. I know a lot of guys say, oh, the fish can't see it, blah, blah, blah. I don't like the way it knots. It's difficult to knot. To me, it's very stiff and very hard. I find it, it's just sort of brittle and wiry. I just don't like it. I have used it. There might be occasions in the future where there's new fluor carbons coming out with certain properties I do like, i.e. suppleness. Um, then I possibly might use it. But at the moment, hang on. There's not much out there that touch wood. I'm not catching, so why would I want to change? If I had to put my hand up, did I want mono or braid? I'm afraid I'd put my hand up. I am a mono man. Next question is from Alan Bellwood, and he says, Graham has written a number of books, most of which I have owned for years. Have you considered writing a book detailing the totally awesome approach to angling on a budget, including the often forgotten techniques which you remind us of on a regular basis? Yeah, that's another good question, because I have actually written 16 fishing books, it's just a sort of phase I was going through at the time. The first one was a little booklet called, I think, Fishing in the Isles of Silly. It was a tiny little thin thing. And it was printed by Headland Printers, I think, down in Penzance and sold on the Isles of Silly. And it pertained, obviously, just to the Isles of Silly. And that sort of got me in the book writing mode. And then I, well, there was a way. Because I do all round angling, I could do anything. Trout, course, sea, it was all in there. Um, even done a big game fishing book called uh, Big Game Fishing, The Great Adventure, which I really enjoyed writing because it was... Nowadays, you know, you don't get what they call descriptive writing. Um, nowadays it's all how to shot a waggler, how to this, how to that, which of course I understand people want to learn knowledge, but the, if you like, the wordsmith skill of writing now has sort of faded away and it's not such a quality read as it used to be. And that is why a Totally Awesome Fishing Show has turned to uh, this thing. Come on, wake up. Yes, the camera, the video camera. Get yourself a decent camera and we can portray to you all that information that you so crave. And indeed, as the gentleman said, the beginner's tips. And in the books, I really put some tips in there, but I didn't do all the, what I call the, the basic stuff, the really, really basic stuff, which was, you know, how to catch some of those fish the most easy way you can. And today, I feel as though it's overcomplicating it. It's a real gizmo bits of uh, wizardry they try and sell you that you must have. And yet, I still go back to tackle and just rigs and baits I used 30 and 40 years ago and I still catch fish. It's like it's gone full circle. That's absolutely what it is. But keep watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. There will be more how-tos, beginner stuff. You know, we're gradually grade through it. I don't ever think we're gonna get really into the advanced stuff. 
The one I haven't done is advanced shark fishing, which has got some of my really secret tips in, and marlin fishing, which I did far too much of it when I was a younger man. Probably caught far too many fish as well. Good question. <coughs> Next one, Mike. Let's keep it moving. Next question is from Andy Hind, who says, what is your most valued piece of fishing tackle? Well, it's not, I think with a lot of anglers when they're older, especially if you've been using old kit for a long time. Yes, I've been using very old kit for a very long time. It's not the financial value of it. It's the memories that that piece of tackle can hold for you. And in that respect, I suppose, because I did do a lot of big game fishing, a lot of marlin fishing, not a particularly big reel, it's a Shimano Triton, uh, this one, but it's a 50 wide, it's a TTW, it's a 50 wide, and normally you'd have a 50 pound reel, a 30 pound reel, 20 pound reel, but this is a 50 wide, which for marlin will get, give me another 200 metres of line on there. So I got a gazillion, gazillion yards of line there for a fish to rip out, and I had some good fish on this. Trust me, I had some really good fish on it. Nice. Oh man, that makes me cold quivery. I've had so many fish, probably over 400 pounds on this, that, you know, I really would be most upset if I lost it. It's not worth a lot of money. It's not, as I say, it's not the financial value. It's just I've got a pair of these, and they're great reels. And do you know what? I haven't even had them serviced. Don't tell anybody. I've changed the drag plates in there, which you get a fibre drag plate with them. I can dismantle these, I can strip them right down, I can service them myself. But I should have got it serviced properly. But there you go, still working. And another one which I value, again, for historical reasons, comes in a little triangular case. All those, all those collectors out there are going, oh my God, he's got one of those. It's an old Illingworth one which is one of the first fixed balls, really. It's a, it's a bobbin type, really. It was based on the principle of a, of a bobbin going up and down, sewing up and down. But just look at that. That is a piece of craftsmanship from yesteryear that was used... No, not marlin fishing, not marlin fishing. Don't be stupid. It was used for freshwater fishing. But as you can see, that was, in effect, the early bail arm. The line just hooked in there. And when you wanted to cast, you just take it out, put it around your finger, cast out and wind in like a demented ninny, I should think, if you had a big pike. But it's for small fish. But I love that little reel, you know, because they don't obviously make them like that anymore. Again, it's not worth a lot of money. It's just the age of it and the fact, look at that lovely little box it can go in. It slides in there, away it goes, and it's in the original box. So yeah, a couple of pieces of tackle that, you know, I do have some attachment to. Now the next question is from, well, we've had a lot of emails from his very loyal follower, and that's Barney Richardson. And Barney's asked, what is your most memorable freshwater catch and saltwater catch? Mm. Well, I'll tell you, I don't really have anything like that. I've got obviously good memories of so many different, well, not just big fish, it might be the day in question. I suppose one of my best freshwater catches was not, well, there was two, it was not the really the size, but years ago we used to have keep nets and used to weigh everything, and you don't use those now, obviously you don't, um, you don't what we call bag up on fish. But I had two. One was, well, I suppose about 25 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. It was down at a lake in the New Forest, and I wanted to get my own personal target of how many fish I could catch on a floater in one day. Not numbers, weight of fish. And I had three different giant keep nets on the go, and I had somebody weighing them for me. They do actually have some matches like this now, I think. And the total weight, I think, was 303 pounds, five ounces, all on floaters on an even rod and five pound line. Nothing big, I didn't crack double figures, they're all carp. But I had, oh, I know I had over 50 pounds of those on a fly rod. And that took me like forever. In fact, that probably cost me almost another 50 pounds because it took so long to fight them on a the fly rod, I couldn't get them to the net. Because when you get a carp on a, on a light fly rod, it hoops up like this. And you go to draw it towards the net and, and nothing happens because the rods are soft. So that was, say, a still water catch. And the rivers, I can remember being down... It was along the pile stretch of the royalty on the Hampshire Raven where I spent an inordinate amount of time years ago back in, well, probably late 60s, early 70s. It was when everybody was using maggots down there before they banned the maggots because they caught too many fish. And we had to change over. And I changed over to lunch and meat. But I was given a tip by a guy called, his name, well, we used to call him, hey, you talk like that all the time, how are you doing, Graham? You get a few fish now and then, are you? So we called him Country John. He came from Yeovil. 
where he is now, six feet under, I should think, because I'm getting on a bit. But his name was Country John from Yeovil. He was a la mustard with a single cube of luncheon meat, a really big piece, free lining it through tiny little gaps in the weed. He caught a lot of barbel, not big barbel. 10 pound then was a very, you know, really big barbel, but you know, fours to sevens and eights. And I had, I think it was 107 pound, nine ounces of barbel by what we call trundling, just running the, the meat through a tiny, tiny gap where it, it ran from shallows into a deep pool along the piles. It's still there, but it's obviously moved up and downstream. It, it would always be there because of the natural configuration of the river. But there was just one little slot. And if I could sink the luncheon meat and get it to go through that hole, man, they must have been laying up there, racked up like barracuda, shoulder barracuda. And I did, I think I had fished to nine pounds five. That was good. Well, on the big fish states, it's hard to say really. You'd think, you'd want to say eight sharks over a thousand, it'd be a thousand pounds, but you know, not the greatest fight. One of the most memorable fights, I remember, if you can call it a fight, was a marlin of 460 pounds, a Pacific blue marlin, that was taken on 50 pound tackle. And the boat, it's in my book, Big Game Fishing, The Great Adventure, so don't. But if you don't believe what I'm saying, it's in there. Um, and we caught that fish in something like, I think it's six minutes we got this fish on, and it just went crackers at the boat. And the Mexican guy nearly got yanked off the stern when he gaffed it. Obviously, we ate the fish. Fish come in. I didn't eat all the fish. Of course, I didn't eat all the fish. Everybody ate the fish because we brought them in those days. Uh, but that I remember that. And we got in. And the skipper actually says his name was Carlos Cosa, I think his name was. And I think the boat's name was Bacardi. Might even still be around. Down in Cabo San Lucas in Mexico. He said, no one is ever, ever going to believe we got 460 pound marlin in six minutes. So he rubbed the chalkboard out and he put 15 minutes. So if anybody ever looks up and sees 15 minutes, trust me, we only put that to make it sort of believable because it was so outlandish and it happened right at dawn in the half light. Nobody ever would believe us really. So two or three catches there, but trust me, we haven't got enough film in the camera for me to put all my memories on there, all the fish that I did, you know, I do really remember vividly or even vividly. <laughs> I can't drink it. I can't stop. You don't want to in this, do you? You think it's tea, don't you? Aha. <laughs> is it tea? What's the next question, Mike? Let's give it. And the next question is from Charlie Bear. And he's got two questions, actually. He says, first question is, how did you get into fishing? And the second one is, what fisherman inspired you to keep doing what you're doing now? Okay, got into fishing when I was eight years old on a family holiday down at Timmouth in Devon. I caught a starfish off the beach on a little rod and reel that my parents must have bought me just to shut me up from whining all the time. And we carried the said starfish with great pride to the local aquarium in Timmouth. Unfortunately, when I went into the aquarium, what did I see? No, not starfish. I saw rather a large amount of fish swimming around. So my starfish got ceremoniously lowered in to all... Well done, young Graham. Look at what you've put in there. Aren't you a clever boy? But unfortunately, I was beep, 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 looking at all these fish swimming around. So that's how it started. Eight years old, and it's gone pretty much downhill since then. As for our inspiration from other people, I wouldn't say I had any inspiration. I've always been my own man. I've always tried to do my own pioneering. Obviously, there are people that influence you and you know, I didn't have a mentor. My dad wasn't a fisherman. He went fishing with me, but he certainly wasn't a fisherman. He just came into it, probably just shut me up, I should think. But he did get into it after a while. He had to go to work, though, obviously to pay for me. But, you know, he didn't fish as much as I did. I suppose the respect I had for the writing at that time for people, without a shadow of a doubt, would be Dick Walker. <laughs> no surprise there if you're my age. Anybody of, you know, plus 50 is probably going to, if there are any... If, if there are any reader of any um, magazine, book, publication, or in history of carp, going to know about Dick Walker. Um, I suppose then really it would be Jack Hilton, who I used to like, you know, reading his... Uh, it, well, I mean, this was basic stuff, catching carp on potatoes, for God's sake. By the way, you think I'm lying? Look up one of Jack Hilton's books on You will see mention of parboiled potato, and we got it on our DVD and the carp trilogy. Banging out car on parboiled potato. Old school, old school, still works. Who else would there be? I suppose there was a guy, now oh, what was his name? I think his name was Pritchard. I think it might be Mike Pritchard. He did some good writing on sea fishing. On the sea fishing side for small boats, there was a guy called Hugh Stoker, who used to be pretty well Dorset based. And he was one of the early fishing writers as well. 
But my main, yes, I would say mentor, was a late Chris Dorn. Now, Chris Dorn used to be features editor of Angling Times and a great pal of mine. And we used to go on fishing holidays together as well. I had oh, riotous laughs. And he used to be pretty well every Monday morning because I had furniture shops as my business. First thing Monday morning after fishing for the weekend, don't tell anybody at, the, at, at their papers, a reverse charge call to Chris to tell him all of what I'd been catching. And I wanted to know what he'd been doing during the weekend. Sometimes that lasted an hour, guys, or even more. I dread to know what the phone bill was, but it was all picked up. But Chris got me into photography as well, and we did some great fishing trips together. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, another guy went to Ireland because Ireland has some fantastic fishing. In fact, we've done some recent videos with him. He's still kicking along like me. It's amazing. Paul Harris used to work for the Irish Tourist Board as the angling advisor. He knows a lot about bream. I'm telling you a lot about bream. He's a master at it, good matchman, you know, we still fish with him. I enjoy Paul's company. We have a laugh. We're on the same wavelength. We're just out there to catch fish and get photographs, and that's what that's all there is to it. Dead easy, nice to fish with. So, in the modern world, <laughs> nobody <laughs> don't look up to anybody anymore. You know, some of the stuff written, I just I just think, well, why would they why would they write that? You know, um, I don't think there's anybody in all honesty. There's some American ones. An American book, if you want a a book on a big game fishing, which is a good good read is called Line Down you know the line coming down out the outrigger by I think it's Jack Sampson or it might be Jack Simpson that's a really good read as well but uh, listen I think it's all going to change I think from the magazine reading where you look at people I think now it'll be YouTube and people will be sucking that information out of it hopefully they're sucking the information out of me and getting some information and at least you guys are getting to catch some fish that's what it's about and more important enjoy it next question maestro uh, there's another one from Gavin Rule, who says, What's your view on the fishing community? As I have found that most of the people who take part in fishing are always more than willing to help one another out. Also, what do you think of pole fishing? That's right. Uh, yes, I would say I would be quite divided there. I'd have to say be quite divided. Years ago, uh, they used to have what's called specimen, specimen hunting groups which would you know, be a fishing club basically, but those guys were only interested in the biggest fish. It was like a sort of cult thing, very sort of closed shot, very secret squirrel. It was, well, I didn't enjoy it at all, to be honest. I was off on my own doing my own thing. I was never a member of uh, anything like that, but that was the thing, specimen hunters. We're the so-and-so Smithfield and Western whatever specimen club. And they told you nothing. So if you weren't in that little clique, as it were, of say six or a dozen anglers, you got no information, you didn't know where the fish were coming from. Don't even bother asking specimen hunters <laughs> where to go fishing or any tips. Generally, I have found they're not going to tell you. On the other hand, I'm extremely thick-skinned and I have no qualms if the man down there is catching fish and I'm not. I will wind in, put down and I will go and ask him and if he wants to tell me, he will. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. So specimen hunting, maybe in the big carp, well, they're not going to tell you too much, you know. However, there are carp guys out there that will tell you, and you've got to find them. You know, you've got to ask. Don't be afraid to ask people. You're going to get some miserable Herbert that's never going to ask you. How you going, mate? Okay, walk on. That's it, walk on. You're not going to get any information. But if you find somebody that's willing to pass that information on, and you generally find the older guys are willing to pass it on, they've done it all. They've perhaps been through that, that sort of specimen hunting uh, era, and they've caught a few big fish, got nothing left to prove, really. They might pass you some information on, don't expect them to tell you their best swims, will you? I'm not going to do that if I was in their position. On the other hand, I have found if you go beach fishing or shore fishing, the guys almost to a tee, you can walk up to a beach almost anywhere, morning, noon, night, and if you ask a question, they're generally, whether they know it or not, will answer you and you know will try and help you out where they can. And, I, and another thing, they give you bait. I've had loads of times where people are packing up, here you are, mate, do you want some bait left over? Well, I don't get that around the carp, Blake, do they? They're not going to give you a bag of boilies, are they? They won't give you anything. So I find freshwater anglers, yeah, maybe it's a bit tough trying to get some information out of them. The sea fishermen, whole different ball game. It's much more open. Everybody, you know, the, the fish aren't enclosed in a little pond, are they trapped in there? Or a lake or something. They're out in the ocean. We're all in it together. We're all trying to catch wild fish out in the ocean. It's not so easy. So it helps everybody if you do share a bit of information. I hope that helps. If I know what you mean, pole fishing. I don't particularly get on with pole fishing because a lot of my fishing has been striking. You know, you want to strike fast. 
I can't strike with the pole. I want to go up. And I know that you ship the pole in the back and you take the sections out. Da, 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 and the rubber band goes around, boing, boing, boing. So it's just, it's just not for me. You know, it's a sort of, I don't know, it seems a bit of a slow method of fishing. They're very, very successful. Don't get me wrong. You know, if it's match fishing, they'll probably knock you into a cocked hat. If, if it's a match fishing thing you're after, you know, you want to put fish in the net, they probably will outfish you. So I'm not saying the method doesn't work. I'm just saying it's not for me. I like using a reel, working it in and out. I like the casting. I don't want to sit there just like that for hour upon hour. I want to go, Gah! Yeah, damn it, strike it, strike it, the fish, oh, where's the net? Where's the net? We've got no net. I like all that. I like that. I like the action. And the next question is from... Harold, forgive me if I get your surname wrong, Aogi, and he's got two questions from Stateside. What's your favourite thing to munch on while fishing? And are you worried about the Hugh Fish fight craze, which he encourages the people to eat our beloved game fish? Well, I like bread. I do like bread. Obviously, I like bread. But then I end up using it as carp bait, don't I? My favourite thing to munch on. I like spag bowl. I do like spaghetti bolognese. I like pasta, all that sort of stuff. Um, not really. I suppose that I'm not really into like too much snack food. I don't. I'm not you know a total health freak, but you know I'd like to live, live as long as possible, like everybody else. So I try and avoid. I don't eat a lot of chocolate. I do not eat a lot of chocolate. That's the truth of it. But I like cakes. I said I like cake. What can I say? I like a nice steak now and then. <laughs> if you can afford it, I like a nice steak. But one thing I do have, and that's since a kid, don't know around the world whether you get this stuff, it's called sandwich bread. Comes in a jar, made by, <laughs> mustn't say, but sandwich bread, I love that. I could just eat that on anything. I could almost eat it on cake. So if I'm out fishing, the other thing I used to have, which I used to be quite famous for when I used to go pike fishing around the Reading area, Early in the morning in the winter, we'd be casting out big dead baits, and people will always know where Graham's fishing and where, where he was on a slightly breezy day, because I had flasks full of, big flasks, you know, full of double cans of vegetable soup, which when you heat it up and you put in this flask and you left for a few hours and you opened up, so I smelled nothing like vegetable soup smells when you're in a restaurant. And this wafted down the lake, and every other lake used to jeer and shout, oh, he's got the vegetable soup out again. And of course, they were quite right. But I like... Sandwich bread, I'd say, I probably have this stuff every day. At least once a day, I have a sandwich bread sandwich. 11 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Mr. Boring, but hey, that's the way it is. Well, I mean, the fact is, there is a huge problem. Absolutely, I put this uh, tea, tea down. There is a huge problem with what we call discards. I mean, it's shocking. You get this quota system, which I suppose this guy's trying to highlight the fact that there is waste. Indeed, there is waste, and I think it's shocking. But what's happening is, by diverting attention from, let's say, a fish it is on a quota, let's say, cod for argument's sake, is on a quota, to go and eat other fish, well, hang on, you're still, you're, you're still, you're still gonna be catching other fish and you're still going to get a bycatch from that in some way shape or form that's just the way the industry is a huge net sweeps through it sweeps and crushes everything up most of it's dead they shovel it over the side or i've heard they even have a shoot with a tube now and it just tubes it straight over the side it's all dead it's all wasted what i can't understand is two things why we can't use that for protein that wastage fish and why, when I went recently to Ireland, I saw 100 tonnes of boar fish, which I've never even seen a boar fish before, it's about this big, it's tiny, being unloaded at a commercial fish dock during the night when I was fishing for six gill sharks from the shore. Remember that one? I said to the guy we were talking there, Paul Harris was with me, and Paul asked him, I think, um, you know, what do you do with this? He said, we're not going to get much money for them, because he said... All they're going to make is salmon feed. They're going to be dried and crushed, crushed and dried into salmon feed to feed salmon. Now, listen, guys, that can't be right, can it? A hundred tons of protein fish being squashed into a tiny pellet the size of your thumbnail and then fed to another fish in the sea in a net, which is banged on the head and then fed to us. That does not make sense to me at all. I don't even think that makes business sense, surely. Why not? Crush it down, process it into that pro 
protein pill like there, I have no problem that the fish are dead and we've got to eat fish, we're human beings, we're predators. I have no problem eating the fish. Crush it down to the pellet, but don't feed it to another fish to feed to us just because that's one glitzy one. It's, ooh, it's salmon. Why don't we crush it to a pellet and then we can have it like a supplement or pills or cornflakes and gives us protein and it doesn't give another fish protein to then give us protein. It's like a wasted circus, really. But I mean, we can't keep taking. We try and put here on Totally or some fish here. We try and put everything we can back. If you watched our films, something like, how many, Mike? 170? 180. 100, 180 films. Most of those, I put fish back. You name it, rays, common skate, anything we try and put back. It, you put bass back. Oh, can't believe I did that. Why not? Why not put them back? If you're hungry, keep it. Eat it. By all means, eat fish. We're humans. We do eat fish. But, you know, just get the balance right. So that's as best as I can answer that one. Where's my bottle? And this is from James Garner, who says, I'm thinking of getting a boat and using it on river and sea. Do you need insurance? And what things do you need to take with you? Also, on a river, do you need a licence? Well, there's sort of quite, a, quite a lot of questions in there. Let's start with the freshwater first. And of course, it doesn't say which country this is in. I can only speak for the UK. As far as I'm aware, all rivers, particularly the Thames area, which let's say the Thames catchment area is, is the River Thames is, 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 is my sort of area in the south of England. Yes, if you put a powered vessel on there, you're going to need um, a licensing system. I couldn't tell you what the cost is, but you're going to need two things. A license to operate um, with an outboard motor on, on, the, uh, on the Thames, and I assume other rivers have their own regulations on that. But you will almost certainly, well, you will need a fishing license, a rod license for going on a river or indeed a lake or indeed any freshwater fishing in the UK, depending whether you're fishing for salmon or coarse fish, you know, freshwater fish and sea trout, regular trout, you're going to need different types of licenses. You can get these from the local post offices or you can even get them online. I won't mention the cost because, you know, if this lasts for quite a while, it's going to change. And which way is it going to go? Up, of course, that's the only way all prices go. And the other thing is, if you're going out in the sea, as yet, you don't need a license. But you will need insurance, because somebody could run into your boat, or worse, you could run into somebody else's boat, or another person swimming, another person on a jet ski, another person in a kayak, another person in a canoe. With insurance, always think other people. So you're going to need insurance there, but you do not need any licensing and in fact, the only place I know which is really good license system, system is in America, and they, you know, you do seem to get good fisheries protection there. If you can see where your money's going, that's what I'm going to say. If there was a sea angling license, which they have talked about, if the law said sea angling license, I would purchase a sea angler license. I personally think it would be throwing money down the pan because I think people will be off committees with their nice junkets all over there, all over the world, having their little chit chats at the expense of our license money. I don't ever think that license money would get put back into put, putting fish in the sea, which obviously can't do, but creating facilities would be another thing for say shore anglers, creating marinas, yes, for more boat fishermen, creating and repairing slips. I won't mention which place in <laughs> that I go shark fishing a lot, which has a shocking slip there and is in dire need of repair. And it doesn't get repaired, the potholes just get deeper. That would be excellent. I have no problem paying for a sea angling license if you could see where your money's going, but I fear, ho ho, straight into the committee's pocket. And that's my opinion for what it's worth. Guys, we're getting, uh, we're getting, we've got so many questions to get through that I don't think, we're, to be honest, I don't think we're gonna get through all of them, um, but we will be doing more of these videos uh, throughout the, the weeks and uh, months to come up. So we will definitely be doing more of these Q and A videos We'd love to hear your feedback on what you think of them. Uh, so the last question we're going to do today is uh, on Facebook again from Edmund Wood. And he says, recently, would you agree that the pike numbers are falling in canals? Because I sure can't get one on the Union Canal in Edinburgh. Oh, oh, oh. well, I'll tell you one place. I'm not fishing the Union Canal in Edinburgh. I'm not going all that way out in that cold weather. There's no pike up there. Now, listen, pike are under threat and have always been under threat. Well, since I was a nipper, basically. Years ago, they were sort of persecuted for eating out every, all the other fish. Mostly on uh, rivers, they would be they would be pulled out, electro fish, gaffed, hooked, shot, knocked on the head because they eat the brown trout and the rainbow trout and the salmon and the salmon, smolts, pars, all the small ones. 
And, you know, that's what the salmon anglers want to catch. They want to catch game fish, they don't want to catch pike. The pike are eating all their lovely stockfish. I can sort of understand that. What I think they should have done was net or stun all those pike and then either sell or give them to fishing clubs. But that was way back then. It's gone. They were killed. Over in Ireland, they used to buy... Well, they used to come over, so they used to buy, they used to sell pike. People used to catch them from foreign countries come over and, and by the dozen, by the dozen, they used to absolutely mercilessly kill all the pike, put them in freezer vans and take them back to their own country and sell them. Why well, that can't last, can it? That's got to stop. So that years ago, they were persecuted. Then there was a sort of, I, I couldn't tell you, I suppose it was the 70s, about, about the 70s. You'd need to talk to somebody, one of the experts like, say, Neville Fickling, who's recognised as a piking expert. But I would say about 70s to 80s, the pike had a sort of resurgence, as it were, and were protected. You know, they don't kill any pike, guys. You know, they're good to catch. It's, it's something for us to catch for the winter. And they do actually, you know, everybody thinks they kill all good fish. No, they don't. They kill the weak ones. They kill the weak ones, the dead ones, the dying ones. If there's a shoulder roach and a pike's laying off them, and you ever seen this in water, if you ever, you know, a lot of people don't do river craft or lake craft now, they just go fishing and don't really think about it. But if I've studied them as well, and if they're fresh and live fish, as the pike lunges for them, a lot of the time that strike doesn't connect because they're all fresh fish. Boom, they're gone. They're all live, fresh fit. A bit like me, really. If they're weak and they're injured, or they're dying, or old age, whatever, they're just that little bit slower to get away from the shoal, and they might be the straggler at the back, Bam, the pike's going to nail him. Now, he's doing you a favour. He's getting rid of the low end of the chain. He's, he's clearing out for you. He's there for a reason. He's been there for millennia, for millions of years. These fish are predators, and they eat the prey. Along come the humans, and kill all the predators. And then all these other fish, the shoal fish, the prey fish, they just go boom, because they've got no predators. Predators. What do they do? They grow to a big size and after a while those all die off and you end up with lots of little stunted ones because there's more fish than that water can take care of. So the pike definitely has a place. Now, that was that period, 1970s, 1980s. Ask a pike an expert of my age and they will probably tell you it's about right. This is how I see it. And then what's happening now is they're again under threat because it's getting back to so people are killing them, but this time they're killing them, not just because they, they eat salmon and trout, but they're killing to eat them, unfortunately. And I guess some people do sell them. So how are we going to get around that one? You guys know what I'm talking about. How are we going to get around people killing pike for food? I do not know. If it's allowed, it's allowed. But if it's on a club water, it's definitely not allowed. Put the pike back. For me, I'm not that hungry. I don't want to kill a pike. It don't exactly taste good anyway, do they? You know, why would you want to kill it? If you kill it, that's that fish gone for next year and the year after and the year after. So you might have one good day's fishing. You could go back with a bucket load of dead pike, go back after about three or four of those trips, and you will find harder and harder and harder to catch a pike. Eventually you'll catch no pike. And that way, no winners. Take my advice, guys. If you're not dying of starvation, why not just put them back? It gives you sport for another day. And that's what it's all about. Well, guys, that's the end of our Q&A session. Uh, hopefully some of those tips have been really useful for you. Uh, it's, been, it's been great for us actually to see some of your comments. There's some really useful comments in there. Uh, we hope to do a lot more of these videos in the future as well, just because it, A, it saves us the time of having to individually reply to loads of comments, and B, it can just answer a, a load of questions for you guys, and it also get, allows you guys to find out a bit more about us. Bear in mind that this fishing show is just literally me and Graham. That's all it's been. We've been going just over two years now, and we've gone from being just a father and fun, father and uh, son fishing show to being, you know, the biggest fishing show in Europe online. So um, it's been a real whirlwind of a journey, but we couldn't have done it without you guys. So thanks very much for hitting that subscribe button. I think at this present time, we're at about 24,000 subscribers, and nearly 4 million views. Uh, our fourth, we just had our fourth video go over 100,000 views, uh, which is brilliant. That's only been up since March and is now uh, November. So huge thanks to all you guys for subscribing. Follow us on our Facebook. We are on Facebook, Totally Awesome Fishing. Follow us on our Twitter, TA Fishing, just like our YouTube name. And yeah, just keep uh, keep following and spreading the good word. I think I've tired him out, though. He's looking pretty knackered now. Slate! <laughs> Slate! Consider yourself a fisherman.
Just how far do you want to take it? Subscribe to this channel for more awesome videos.